Welcome everyone to the second session of the seventh edition of the Vacuum Transport Seminars. Um, today we have the pleasure to attend to two very interesting talks on the one hand side, the first one from uh, Mohamed from Swiss Loop, uh, which Andrea is going to present in uh, briefly, and the second one, a master thesis of Akash in collaboration uh, with Eurotube and the University of Edinburgh. So um, I would like, before I would uh, like to give the word to Andrea, I would like to highlight that um, you can drop your questions uh, in this channel under the tab Q&A. These questions are um, anonymous, so do not hesitate to place the questions to enhance the, the exchange and the um, yeah, communication between the, the speeches. So um, without waiting anymore, I would like to hand in to you, Andrea, to make the first presentation of the, the first talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel, and also welcome from my side. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to present to you the first talk. The, um, it's from Mohamed Satfi. He is um, working together with Swissloop on his bachelor thesis. He's doing his bachelor um, of electrical engineering at ETH. And he's gonna present to us his uh, bachelor thesis about the commissioning of a novel radar speed sensor for a Hyperloop prototype. And he will present us its integration with other um, speed sensors. And he will pro provide us a brief explanation of the functionality and how to obtain a precise value of speed. So um, thank you, Mohamed, for being here. And we are looking forward to the talk. And I say the stage is yours. Thank you. Let me just share my screen. Yeah, we see the screen. Mm -hmm. Is there anything super? Yeah. Yeah, so thank you everyone. So I'm Mohammed, I'm doing like my bachelor thesis now, and it was about commissioning a novel weather speed sensor, like Andrea said. So my supervisor is Michele Magno, a doctor from um, the project-based learning from ETH, and uh, the professor is Fran Duffer. So um, here's a small outline for the, uh, for the presentation. So at first I'm going to just present really quickly Swiss Loop and uh, the project motivation and goals. Then I'm going to go a bit further into the hardware I used. So all the sensors, the MCUs for the programming. And then I'm going to present, present the firmware and the implementation of uh, reading the sensors and filtering the measurements to get rid of uh, the noise and get better accuracy and uh, performance. And then I'm, uh, at last, I'm just going to talk a bit how I tested everything and show you some plots of uh, filtering and uh, say what I achieved and uh, the possible improvement for next year and, uh, and so on. So Swiss Loop, it was a student-based uh, student organization uh, founded in 2016 by a group of students from ETH. So the main goal is to uh, advance the research and the vacuum transportation. So each year they have a group of students, like 10 focus special students that work uh, the whole year on um, to uh, design a new prototype. And every year they, uh, they compete into, uh, in uh, the European Hyperloop Week. And uh, this year it's going, to be, it's going to be in Edinburgh. So, um, the motiva motivation are clear. So the technology is always improving and uh, we have to get better accuracy accuracy and efficiency. So that's why uh, we always need to improve our sensors and our measurement. So uh, the main goal of my thesis, so at first it was to um, develop, uh, implement the firmware for the Dopre sensor. So the, the, the speed sensor uh, to, so it was um, to get the speed uh, measurement and uh, also um, other sensor like an accelerometer to get the acceleration measurement and uh, then test everything if it's working fine and uh, finally um, uh, implement the Kalman filter to combine all the sensor together and uh, get um, more accurate speed uh, measurement. And finally do some testing with the filtering and uh, get everything ready to be used next year in the pod. 
I see there is a oh, question. Uh, so thank you. So now I'm going to present very quickly the sensor I used. So um, on the left, it was the GAM uh, 900 sensor. So it was already used last year on the pod of 2021, I think. So I just took it to uh, get additional uh, inertial measurement unit. And uh, so it, uh, it can either send analog signal or can um, or signal through the CAN protocol. So in my thesis, I use the analog signal because it was a bit faster and uh, a bit easier to read with the ADCs of the board. Uh, it can uh, measure three axes of um, acceleration and each axis is, ax, axis is sent through uh, one channel. And the measurement range is uh, so two Gs, so maximal two Gs, and uh, you can adapt it to be uh, less than that when you want. It was a current type um, sensor, so it was a bit of pain, not a pain, but was not really adapted for the developer board because the ADC uh, works with voltage. So I just had to um, adapt it to be able to read it. It's pretty heavy and uh, the error is pretty good, like four millijis. Uh, on the right, you see the main sensor of the thesis. So it was a Doppler sensor uh, that uses the Doppler effect to get speed measurement. So it sent an analog signal. And uh, the um, I'm going to explain a bit the Doppler effect later, but the, uh, the frequency of the signal that uh, is uh, sent is uh, 122 gigahertz, so a bit um, really high. And the measurement range is between uh, zero and uh, 600 kmh. So it can really be applied like later for um, uh, large scale prototype of Hyperloop if you want. And the error is, uh, like, is uh, 0 0.04 kmh until um, up to 100 kmh, and then it's 4% of the superior measurement. So now I'm going also to present the phase sensor PCB. So what does what this PCB does is actually just because the uh, the Doppler sensor uh, gives out a sinus signal and it just make a trigger signal from the sinus signal because it's really uh, make the processing of the signal easier with the board and uh, it really helped a lot. So this PCB was designed by a student from last year, so Hanohis, for the Hyperloop prototype 2021. Uh, and yeah, it was really helpful. So we can see on the image, so some of the main component of the PCB. So the IX connector, the IX output is uh, the main, the cable, the main connector used on the Swiss loop prototype, hyper prototype. So it's, I didn't really use it this year. I use uh, the pins, but uh, for next year, it can be uh, like, it just has to be connected to the vehicle control unit and can be, the signal from the PCB can be used and processed there. So uh, for all the development and the computation, I use uh, the Nucleo board. So this board is uh, used the same uh, microcontrol, microcontrol of um, STM32, like as a, the vehicle control unit from Swissloop. So all the code that was written uh, that I wrote this year can be directly uh, be used in the vehicle control unit from next year. So it has many features. I mean, it was a bit of overkill for my project, but it's better though. So I used uh, the main features I used was the ADCs and the timer of uh, the board. So now I'm going to dip uh, a little bit, uh, a bit more in uh, the firmware implementation. So for the Doppler sensor, so as I said, it was um, to use the Doppler effect to measure the velocity of the pod. So in the uh, in the graph, you can see uh, in orange, it was uh, the raw signal from the sensor. And uh, uh, the white signal is the triggered signal from the PCB that I presented. So the main idea of the sensor is that it sends a signal and get a reflected signal and it, it will uh, calculate the difference of frequency because uh, between uh, those two signals, and it will send out this uh, a signal with this frequency. And as you can, as you can see in the former here, and, uh, sorry, so this formula, formula uh, if we get the, um, 
delta f doppler is the frequency shift so okay. the frequency of our signal we can get the delta v so the velocity of our pod so for the implementation i simply uh pro configure two one timer to be triggered at each rising edge and i just uh, saved the values of the timer at two different times like t1 and t2 like uh, you see on the uh, on the slide and uh, i just I just calculated the period of the signal by subtracting the two signals, and then I just had to invert it to get the frequency, and then just some computation to get the velocity. Uh, for the GAM, uh, GAM 900 uh, sensor, so it's an accelerometer, so current type. So to get the, to be able to read the acceleration, I had to connect the resistance in parallel to the channels and then measure with the ADC the voltage across um, the resistance because of the ADC only take uh, voltage inputs. Uh, so the ADC of the board is 16-bit uh, resolution, so it can measure up to um, 65,536 possible sample values. Uh, it's pretty accurate. And uh, the sensor itself, uh, sends a signal analog current output between four and 20 uh, milliamps, where four milliamps is the minimal acceleration. So minus two Gs and 20, uh, 20 milliamp is the maximal acceleration. So now after reading the two signals and testing everything to be, uh, be sure that well, it was the uh, right uh, values, I had to do some, to combine the two sensor in a Kalman filter to get a really accurate uh, speed measurement. So the main idea of the Kalman filter is just filtering uh, method. So like it takes uh, the two measurement as a, of uh, the sensor and it's going to combine them. Like I just uh, combined them in the dynamic model, like the velocity on the next step is equal to the velocity and the uh, step before plus the acceleration uh, multiplied by the time interval. And uh, with this, with the Kalman filtering, I can I got able to get rid like to of the noise of the sensors, and it's a really um, effective uh, method if you want. Like it, we can combine many many sensors in it, and uh, we can really get a, an accurate speed measurement uh, for from our sensors. Like uh, as you see on the diagram, we get here we get out an estimated state and this state is going is always updated to be to fit uh, as good as possible the measurement that we get from the sensors so i'm just going to explain a bit more the implementation behind it so as you see you have the predict step like you we take the measurement from the past uh, time um, uh, past uh, iteration and you predict the next um, next state so in uh, for my case in my state i just had the velocity and the acceleration and i just used um, a basic dynamic uh, model like as you see in this equation uh, to predict the next step and for um, the other matrices like um, the p matrix that estimated the covariance of the error uh, I had, um, I just it, uh, always update the um, error of our process, you can say, and the Q and the Q and um, R matrix are the error of the process and the measurement. So the R matrix uh, are the errors of the measurement, of the measurement, so of the sensors. And uh, by changing those values, you can really act on the filtering of the signals. So now I'm going to show you some of the results results I got. So here we can see, so the green signal is the noisy data. So for testing, I just did the arranged values between one and um, 1000 and uh, just added some noise to it and uh, passed the noisy data in the Kalman filter. And here are the results I got, I gotten. 
So the noisy signal is a green signal, as you say, and the red signal is the output of the Kalman filter. So we can see that I, I was able to get rid of like 50% of the noise and I could change, I, I even got better filtering by uh, changing the values of uh, the R metrics, so the error of my signals. And the, bl the blue signal is the ground truth, so the signal, the perfect signal without noise. So here we can see another plot. So in this plot, I, I, I increased a lot the values of the R matrix, so the error of the, of the center of the signal. And I, we can see that we get really, really good filtering and almost no noise. And on the graph below, you can see the error of the noisy signal and the error of the filtered signal. So what I achieved, so until now, I still have four weeks left. So I think I'm going to improve a bit more my filter, like maybe an extended Kalman filter or to get really rid, to get rid of the no, all the noise and be able to support nonlinear systems and everything. So, but what I achieved until now, so I, I measured the, we can see we can say that the firmware for the dock ray is almost finished. Like I, I was able to read the frequency and then calculate the speed of the from the sensor, and I, it can be directly used on uh, the pod of Nexer. And I also was able to um, sample the gam the gam nine hundred output current, and I got I get I got really good acceleration values. But it was still, uh, as we can see, we know in the improvement, it the GAM 900 is a really heavy sensor and can be easily replaced by a smaller uh, accelerometer that weighs some grams. Uh, combining of the sensor was really like success. I tested a bit, like just some random testing with moving my hands uh, before the sensor and moving the accelerometer, and I got. It's it's working pretty good, but I it's uh, there still is some testing um, to do. Like maybe next year, when everything can be integrated on the pod, uh, like put the sensor on the pod and everything, and get some um, live data and uh, uh, real testing to improve everything a bit more. And uh, as, as we saw, the noise of the measurement was was really really uh, decreased by the filter. So the possible improvement for next year. So I, I wasn't able to um, integrate my system in the pod of uh, the this year. So because the Swiss Loop team didn't, so the student that was uh, responsible for the vehicle control unit of the pod uh, didn't uh, take into account uh, my thesis and um, on the on the sensors. So there is no like inputs for my sensor or free pins to to connect to ever, all the sensor and compute everything. So next year we the student will have to take into account my thesis and make connectors to my um, to be able to process all the signal he gets from the speed sensors. Um, the computation efficiency is, I think, a bit not really uh, optimal until now because I only use float variable and float variable on uh, MCUs are not the best way to go. So maybe I will try in the four weeks left to improve uh, improve the efficiency by using maybe unsigned integer or I don't know yet. But yeah, that's a real that's an improvement to do because the efficiency like goes directly with the energy efficiency, and it's a really important topic in the hyperloop uh, research. So as I said, so use a small STM accelerometer to spare the weight of the gamma 900. And we can also try to combine other inertial units in the Kalman filter, like maybe the speed sensor that are currently being used on the Swiss loop pod, and maybe also do a Kalman filter for the position measurement. And uh, we can really add us 
integrate a lot of sensor in the Kalman filter. And uh, to improve the accuracy of the Kalman filter, we can uh, maybe also include the controls input of the FAUCU to get a better estimate of the state. So thank you for hearing and for your attention, attention. And if you have some question, I'm here. Answer them if I can. Yeah, thanks a lot, Mohamed, for the presentation. Um, I think it was pretty technical, but very interesting. And there are also some technical questions. Maybe to start with, one question was, what is the sampling rate of the sensor? Uh, so which sensor? I which guess one? it's the Doppler sensor. So um, I don't really, so to, uh, it's not really sampling of the signal, it's more trigger. So how I get the frequency of the signal, I just uh, program the timer. So the timer will get a timer interrupt, interrupt uh, each rising edge of the signal. And at each rising edge, I'm going to just get the value of the timer and then subtract either the, the two values I get between two rising edge and get the, and then process uh, and get the frequency value and then the speed value. So it's not really sampling of the of the speed sensor. It's more like just using the signal from the speed sensor to uh, trigger an enter interrupt on the MCU and then get use uh, this those interrupts to get the signal value, so frequency value. Okay, I don't so know if the, I... yeah. So the interrupt is defined through the speed from the speed sensor, or you can define it yourself. So the interrupt is like uh, when it gets it it uh, has a, like a voltage value, and if we go beyond this voltage value, it gets triggered. And so, uh, it, uh, don't, I didn't, can you repeat? I didn't really get. Uh, if you define, you if you define the interrupt yourself, so for example, with an if statement or something, or if. Oh, no, no, no. So uh, a building. Ah, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, I get it. No, it's a building function of the STM32 uh, microcontroller. Mm -hmm. So it has a library, it's called the HAL, HAL library. And it has many, many predefined interrupts. So I just had to do some configuration and the uh, Cubemix um, programmer and just like check a small box and tell, yeah, you have to enable this interrupt, but interrupt. And uh, then each time uh, th there is a rising edge, it goes into this interrupt automatically. So I didn't have to the interrupt. So to trigger the interrupt, I didn't have to do anything. But then all the processing in the interrupt, yeah, I coded myself. Okay, okay. Then there is also um, a question, is there any drift of the readout values of the sensor output? Um, like drift, what? Uh, so that mean? the value basically drifts away. So it maybe adds over time a, a certain value or... So it's not as accurate anymore. Maybe you could see that with your Kalman filter. So the only drift of that, that I could get is from the, because the timer has a, cannot count to infinity. It has a, I mean, I can preset this, I can set it to the maximum, like, I don't know how exactly what it is, but it has a value up until which it can count and then it's set to zero. To zero. So maybe you can say when it can count until 20 and then after 20, it goes to zero uh, and so on. And so the sensor itself, uh, so the sensor, I took this into account. So I added uh, each over, um, yeah, how, how can I say that? So each each time it, go, it, it got, it went um, beyond the, to any value like the maximal value. I just added like one more time the maximal value to get accurate uh, time measurement. The sensor itself, it's pretty, 
it's pretty accurate. I didn't get any, any drift or anything. It was really the frequency. I also checked it with calculator and just uh, looking at the frequency on the oscilloscope and it was, it, so the, the Doppler sensor is really accurate. The other sensor, the gamma 900 accurate sensor is a bit noisy when we get to the zero acceleration uh, value. So it was more problematic, but the Doppler sensor was really not, didn't have any problem with it. Okay, nice. And then there is also a more like a Hyperloop related question. So um, what object are you expecting for a signal to bounce back? So you say the yeah. Doppler sensor is, because he, he asks um, like a Hyperloop tube in real life is probably very long. So where yeah, does course. the signal bounce back? So um, I don't, I think maybe I can. So, uh, so a student before me did some, um, you can see here, let me just go in really fast. So here, here you can see this file. So he did some testing already on the, different like material, like you can see the asphalt here, um, we, strap. we see only your presentation slide. Ah, sorry. Uh, how can I do this? Uh, sorry, one moment. Are you sure? Uh, here, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, do you see now? Yeah. So the, basically the sensor is going to be like a bit inclined like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, he did some measurement like asphalt, uh, Velcro strap, here carpet. And I mean, uh, we didn't really like, I didn't really test it, I mean, but I think here he got he got the best measurement with carpet or like yeah, but I don't think I mean I didn't really think what would be the best material for the hyper hyperloop tube. But um, if the question is how it's going to be mounted on the on the pod, I mean it's the best way to be mounted is like inclined like this. Mm -hmm. I also tested. It. And so uh, to the front of the pod, or is it on the side? Oh uh, yeah, the front of the pod. It has to be because it's only measure linear mm -hmm. speed. And uh, yeah, and then just uh, we can just add the uh, like as we saw on the on the presentation here. It's really not that difficult. You just have to add the here the cosinus here. It's just the inclination uh, angle. Mm -hmm. And if you just put the angle and uh, you get the frequency. Mm -hmm. But I didn't really do some research about the material or anything. Okay, so and maybe follow up question to that. Um, if, yeah. if it's attached to the pod, then yeah. the relative velocity will be zero, is that right? Um, it's uh, it measures the velocity relative to the track, like oh. where it's moving. Like as that's where the velocity is measuring. Okay, very good. Yeah, I think then we need to close this discussion round. Thank you very yeah, much, Mohamed, no for the questions, Thank and you. thanks everyone for asking the questions. And then I will give the word to Daniel, who will um, t tell us a bit about Akash and what he's going to present. Yeah, exactly. So thank you very much, uh, Mohamed, for the nice talk. The next one thank is um, from Akash. He recently graduated uh, at the University of Edinburgh. And today he's going to uh, tell us a bit more about his master thesis on uh, design of an intermediate storage system using ultra cap, uh, capacitors to supplement a uh, launching sequence. Uh, oh, can of I, 
hyperloop vehicle. Um, exactly. So he will be presenting his master thesis. And to give up a bit of a context, Akash is already since a couple of years uh, involved in the hyperloop environment. Uh, we first met in the EHW 2021 in Valencia, where he helped uh, co-designing uh, the Bell uh, linear induction motor. Uh, subsequently, he did uh, an internship at uh, Eurotube, where he also got involved in the development on, of the in-house prototypes for the for the tubes uh, test tracks, and then uh, finally now uh, through a master thesis in the area of electroengineering, he got to look into more uh, ultra capacitors uh, and a meaningful way of how to supplement the power necessary to to propel. Uh, high speed uh, thoughts. So uh, with this said, Akash, I would like to leave the floor to you. We're really looking forward to, um, to the presentation. You can share the screen in the, the middle icon. Yes, exactly. We see the screen. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, one sec. Um... Yeah, exactly there. Okay. So uh, as Daniel said, the this my master's thesis is about propelling the hyper propelling a hyperloop pod using ultra capacitors, right? And it's be, it it was developed in conjunction with the University of Edinburgh and uh, Eurotube. Uh, currently, I'm in my fifth year of studies, and I'll be graduating with a uh, master's in engineering with electrical and, uh, for electrical and mechanical engineering. And so I'll quickly present uh, my slides. So first things first, uh, just a quick introduction. I mean, I think everybody here pretty much knows what a hyperloop is, but just to go through it, right? It's essentially a bullet train being driven in a vacuum tube, right? Super high speeds, very little resistance. Um, you get completely electrified uh, trackside primary repulsion systems, right? So you get the the goal is to have uh, motors on the track which propel the pod very quickly at high speeds instead of having um, instead of having motors on on the on board to reduce the weight. Um, as I, I, yeah, so weight reduction and aerodynamic drag can get you up to very high speeds on land, right? And you basically have the carbon footprint of a train, but the speed of an aircraft. So why do we need this system? Why do we need to store so much energy to propel the pod? Over this study uh, is for Eurotube's alpha tube uh, uh, system, right? So let's say if the acceleration distance was around 400 meters, uh, how do you accelerate a pod up to 1,000 meters uh, kilometers an hour in that short space of time in a short distance? You need a significant amount of power, which is why you which is why you need this kind of supercapacitor system, which discharges energy very quickly. At the same time, you only have two megawatts available, right, from the grid directly. So again, the the, the idea is to store energy from the grid when uh, when there's when the before the launching sequence and release that energy in a single burst. The system also needs to be bidirectional because um, you want to regenerate power. Once uh, the once the pod is going to break on the recuperator, you want that energy uh, coming back into the system. And at the same time, you also need to charge um, the supercapacitors from the grid. So you need a discharge and you need um, you need a system that's capable of discharging and recharging. Because of the requirements of the inverter, you also need a uh, three kilovolt uh, stable DC bus voltage that needs to be maintained. So uh, for a quick overview, right? As I said, you have a launcher, which is launching the vehicle, and you have a recuperator at the other end, 
which is re which will regenerate power and send it back, right? The power is coming from a grid interface converter, uh, which is converting the AC grid energy into DC, right? And so then you have this three kilovolt DC bus and you have the buffers, uh, which, which, which are formed by the ultra capacitor banks, um, uh, supplementing uh, the energy required for acceleration. Uh, obviously, th th this picture only shows two buffer units or branches, but you can have multiple depending on uh, what's optimal sizing and distances. So this is this is the power curve I was working with. So uh, you need zero to ten megawatts of energy in about three seconds. Two megawatts is available from the grid, and the rest has to be provided by uh, stored energy. Um, yeah, so energy is stored from the grid from the ultra capacitor in advance by charging one to five minutes, um, and then it's discharged in a short burst of two to three seconds and which gives you extremely high discharge currents into the DC bus. So many different topologies were looked at, right? In this case, you would need something that is multi-level. So either, uh, so you would need something that is uh, cascading. So in the, one of the examples of the topologies here is a cascading boost converter. So you're going from low voltage to high voltage in this case, right? And you would have uh, multiple submodules, or oh, sorry, multiple branches over the DC bus to maintain the voltage and um, sub and uh, able to uh, and be able to produce um, adequate power. So as you can see, the system is modular, right? So you have uh, a branch, another branch, and then within branches you have submodules. So you can have multiple branches and then multiple submodules within branches. Yeah. The, another example of a topology is a, a distributed MMC, right? The difference between the two topologies is in this case, we're going from high voltage to low voltage. So in this case, this side has a, a much higher voltage than um, the DC bus, right? So you're stepping down the voltage instead of stepping up. The, so that's the, that's the sort of major difference, right? And also, if we go back here, you can see that on the on the low voltage side, the the ultra capacitor banks are in parallel. But then, on the high voltage side, the DC bus capacitors are in series. Whereas in this case, it, the entire system is sort of in series, where the voltages sort of stack up. Um, so. One reason for opting for multi-level or cascaded topologies was because ultra capacitors have an inherent limit in terms of how many you can stack in series because of their internal resistance. So you would need a significantly uh, so massive sort of heatsink as the internal resistance stacks up, right? And there's also a, a recommended limit from the suppliers uh, of these ultra capacitors at about uh, 1,500 volts in series. Which is why, uh, so one cas in the previous example, cascading it um, uh, sort of circumvents it because the voltages are in parallel, so there's no stacking on the ultra capacitor side. In the MMC case, they are technically stacked, but then they're not on all at the same time, or that you only get sort of high voltages instantaneously rather than it being a cons consistent uh, theme. So th that's how you sort of circumvent that limit or hard limit of 1,500 volts in series. Um, so you can model this using a simplified analytical model, right? The assumption is that each of the submodules discharge symmetrically, right? And you, you can model it using this sort of differential equation here. Um, and its particular solution gives you um, the current at a single time step for a certain amount of power. But if you take that over different sets of uh, different sets of currents, sorry, different sets of uh, time steps and different powers, you can generate a smooth curve 
um, that that gives you a good approximation of uh, how the voltage is going to decay within the ultra capacitors and how the what the current discharge is going to look like. As for this here, the P max, uh, so this this here defines the the limit up to how much uh, you can, how much current you can discharge and what voltage uh, level uh, of what the maximum voltage discharge discharge capability is beyond beyond which the system sort of fails to work so this is this is a curve uh, this is what about what you would expect from an, from a uh, from a from an ultra capacitor right so as as the as energy is being discharged this voltage drops right and the current in the branch rises now how would you size the bank itself um if you if you look at if you look at the those curves with different uh, capacitances you will see that um basically the more energy you have the more delayed the curve is pretty much right and each of these curves sort of tends towards infinity uh, because obviously as the as the voltage starts dropping and drops uh, and starts dropping significantly the the current uh, requirement or because because of this sort of consistent requirement of energy is going to sort of sh uh, shoot towards infinity right so this limit uh, or uh, this voltage limit or voltage de uh, decay limit is defined by the internal resistance of the bank as i showed you in the previous slide right and the the main limitation with the capacitance itself is you need more series you need more uh, branches in parallel when you add capacitance to the bank so you're increasing the cost of the bank so you have to basically balance the needs of the system versus how many um banks you need in parallel um uh, it's a, yeah yeah versus how many banks it's feasible to have in parallel because of the cost limitation so if you uh, this this sort of summarizes uh, the analytical data um over different uh, topologies of the two designs i presented so if you have a cascaded boost converter with two or three submodules within a branch and then also over four branches this is how um these are the sort of max values of current discharge you will see with uh, these expected sort of uh, switch voltage ratings uh, and obviously yeah, the rating of the submodule voltage is derated to about 50 40 to 50 percent of the actual switch voltage voltage rating for safety reasons um so for one branch as you can see the current is excessively high for this voltage range so you won't find uh, commercial igbt's of the shelf igbt's um this for the two to three branch range you can find uh, a viable uh, com uh, commercial igbt's and you but then uh, it's it'll be difficult for uh, sic mosfets uh, in that range so both IGPs and SIC MOSFETs were considered for the study, but ultimately um, we went with um, IGPs because at this point in time, at the voltage ranges and power ranges we're looking at, it is the prevalent technology. In the future, uh, uh, MOSFETs might become more dominant, but yeah, at the moment there's not much uh, evidence or not much uh, sort of research based on the, in this range the sort of yeah in same thing goes for the multi-level converter right uh the the main difference you notice here is because of the much higher branch voltage uh or submodule voltage you'll see reduced currents within the branch but each submodule is gonna see the entire uh, br entire current within the branch right um, and the switch voltage rating also has to go up. But this is, as I said, this is a more viable combination for commercial IGBTs because usually what you see is when you have high current ratings, you also have high voltage ratings, you, but you don't have the opposite where you have low voltage ratings and high current ratings. Um, and this is also measured over different uh, capacitances. 
based on what was optimal for that uh, branch uh, design. This is a quick sort of cost summary. Obviously, uh, this doesn't include uh, uh, supplementary things like circuit breakers and um, um, and uh, sensors and things like that, because those are linearly scalable with each branch. Um, and we don't have much data or, uh, pertaining to those things, and they're not necessarily part of the scope of the project. So if you look at the cost, you can see the uh, multi-level multi converter is significantly cheaper, which is primarily because of the inductors. Uh, because the, the main uh, advantage of a multi-level converter is you will see a lot less ripple in the DC bus voltage with the multi-level converter as opposed to cascaded boost converters. Uh, uh, because you're, you're going from, say, you're not, you're, you're not, um, the, how do I explain this? Um, the, for the cascading boost converters, the ripple sort of adds up because you have multiple units in parallel. You, you could uh, do things like interleaving them, but obviously that adds to the complexity of the design. Um, whereas with the multi-level converter, you're going from one level to another. So that the ripple uh, sort of reduces because you're reducing the voltage step of going up. Um, and this is a sort of summary of all the 10 topologies that were considered, uh, nine topologies here, but yeah. And as you can see, um, as you add more branches to the uh, branches and sub modules to the cascaded uh, boost converter, the cost goes up quite significantly because of the problem I mentioned with the inductors. Whereas with the, for the MMC, the inductors are significantly less expensive um, and the costs sort of scale up very well as you add more and more branches. Uh, in potentially, you could also do things like uh, reducing the power density of the supercapacitor models. So the ones we're using right now are, are probably one of some of the most dense models, or some of the dense uh, modules available in the industry from Skeleton. Uh, but you could go with less dense modules from, say, for example, Maxwell, when you have 10, 20 branches over a longer acceleration distance, because each module needs to provide less energy. So that that will help it scale much better as uh, as you work with sort of longer acceleration distances. Now moving on to the control concept for for the storage system, you would need a two loop controller to do this. So the the first loop would uh, measure the current going across the inductor, right, and basically the current going across the inductor is is going to be a function of the difference between the voltage stacking of the supercapacitors and the voltage on the dc bus right and then that will then inform the second loop about what duty cycle you need to provide so that you keep the voltage at the three kilovolt level right and the formulas here sort of give an idea of how to measure, how to uh, set the PI parameters within the controllers. Um, at least it gives you the first step and after that you do a bit of tuning. And now the values you get out of the two loop controller uh, then go into a balancing algorithm, right? So the, the, one of the issues with the multi-level design is the, the, the sub-modules within the branch need to be balanced out so that one module doesn't get, one sub-module doesn't get uh, too much, uh, doesn't uh, overproduce current. So otherwise you need to sort of oversize your uh, switches even more. So the, the idea here is you have a baseline of two modules being on, and then you switch on a third module um, on, you PWM in a third module, which it takes you up to the uh, three kilovolt and that's how you sort of balance it. Oh, sorry, but that, that's how you get to the three kilovolt uh, level, right? So you, you go at a, so the two, two ultra capacitor modules 
put together give you a voltage slightly less than 3 kilovolts. And then uh, when 3 are on, it gives you a voltage level slightly above um, 3 kilovolts. And then over time, with high switching frequencies, that balances out to around 3 kilovolts, right? In terms of the balancing, let's say you have uh, bank 1 and bank 2 on, uh, and then bank 3 PWMs. So it goes on and off for a few cycles. After a few cycles, you will see that bank one and two, which are in the baseline, have uh, decayed more than the uh, than bank one, which was PWMing. So you switch roles. So the bank which was PWMing now goes into the baseline, and one of the banks in the baseline starts PWMing instead. And over time, that balances out the voltages um, that you see. Uh, it, within the submodules. So this is a per branch controller model for the um, for the MMC structure developed in uh, MATLAB Simulink, right? So this here highlighted in green is the two loop controller model that gives an output duty cycle. This output duty cycle goes into the balancing algorithm and the balancing algorithm, as I explained in the previous slide, then gives the output, uh, the output duty cycle uh, or, and switching states uh, into the switches here that help maintain the bus at three kilovolts and produce the energy that is required to accelerate the vehicle. And uh, this is the system performance of the two loop controller. The first graph is of the duty cycle output. As you can see, it is it is it it it's it's steadily rising because the voltage de because the the source the, the voltage from the input obviously decreases, right? Um, the current uh, requirement rises because of the load curve, and I think the the DC bus current ripple is around two and a half to three percent here. Right, and this is the volt, uh, the DC bus voltage uh, waveform, and the distortion here is around one percent, um, which was what was sort of required for this uh, uh, setup within Alpha Tube. And so, within the two loop controller, I also had uh, some open loop feed forward elements. The rest of the controller was closed loop, but this feed forward element basically had um, had data uh, using a lookup table of uh, previous iterations um, of the duty cycle values, right? And as you can see, uh, this blue curve here is the, is the one which has the feed forward control and the red curve is without it. You will see a huge sort of uh, decrease in the DC bus voltage, obviously, because the capacity, you're taking, ener you're taking energy out of the capacitor to compensate for the immediate burst in energy you need, right? Until the controller and the system can respond. So you have this under and overshoot in the DC bus voltage. But if you predict it properly using the feed forward control, you have a much more balanced uh, DC bus voltage from the beginning. This, this means you can reduce your uh, capacitor size by quite a bit on the DC bus uh, because you don't see any of these uh, sort of massive overshoots. And so moving on to the sort of balancing algorithm, the performance of the bal balancing al algorithm in discharge mode, right? So as you can see, um, I've tested it with sort of different starting voltages. So if the starting voltage had a 2.5 volt difference, you will see that they quickly start balancing out. And as the voltage uh, difference in the beginning increases, the balancing takes more and more time. But at some point in time, they will balance. It's just that this 15 volt model will not balance over the three second or, or 2.4 second operating time here. So, so if you had 30, 40 volts, it would still balance. It's just, it would take more and successively more and more time to do so. This is the system performance uh, when uh, recharging. So this, this small part of the curve here is when you get the regenerated power over a short period of time. So you see this quick rise uh, in the submodule in the, uh, in, the, in, the, 
back in the supercapacitor, right? So the, the voltage uh, goes back up, right? And then you slow charge from the grid over one or two minutes, depending on how much power you're putting in. The, the goal of this uh, study was to basically sh to prove that the controller design can accommodate bidirectional power flow and help charge the the um, help charge the the storage system back again, right? But the the charging control itself uh, should be done from the grid uh, uh, the grid connected converter side in terms of how much power it's producing. So these two uh, systems sort of need to coordinate with each other when this this during this phase. But obviously, because that part of the system is not developed yet, um, there is quite a bit of ambiguity as to how that would happen. But uh, based on the results of uh, the design, you can see that it, the design itself can cope with uh, bidirectional power flow quite well and keep it balanced. As you can see, the, the curves are fully balanced, so you can't see the other, the other curves. They're all overlapping each other. Um, and to quickly conclude, um, um, yeah, so the primary aim was of the project was to develop a scalable and cost-effective storage system to assist in the propulsion of hyperloop vehicle. The proposed system uh, meets all these goals. And from now on, the next steps would be to uh, implement the control system on a real-time controller, an FPGA or an ASIC, and then con uh, conduct small-scale testing to gather empirical values because right now the model I used is uh, doesn't have physical parameters so it, it doesn't use the physical uh, modeling within Simulink which would need a lot more parameters so you would need uh, the next step would be to make a model that is more representative of a physical system and see the the response and the tuning that you would need then uh, then of course you need to size the heat sinks for the switches and the and the ultra capacitor banks using a data from the thermal modeling you would get uh, from the physical uh, system and then uh, finally you would also need a sort of fault analysis to size the DC, uh, to size dc circuit breakers and yeah that's uh, all from me thank you very much and uh, uh, please if you want to ask any questions that you might have Thank you very much, Akash, for the nice presentation. There are some um, questions from the audience, which we will tackle, tackle straight away. Uh, the first one is regarding the both charging time. So um, the the time which takes to to charge the pod is depending on the the frequency, right? So the question is. How long will it take until uh, one unit is charged? And do you think this will be a critical point for the final implementation? Um, it, it really depends. So um, based on the results, it, do, it doesn't really matter how long you charge it over. Um, it, the system should still be able to keep it balanced uh, while it's charging. Um, in my study itself, I didn't find too many limitations to the uh, charging. I mean, there is a chance that once you uh, go to uh, low, lower powers, the, the, the balancing results might be a bit more wonky. Uh, so I'm not sure. No. Um, but otherwise, there is no sort of definite limitation as to how long it could take to charge it other than how long you would need to sort of have more vehicles sort of moving in and uh, being accelerated. So ideally, what yeah. would what would be then the fastest uh, charging time we could have when looking at the, the frequencies we could fa be facing? So if, let's say over under one minute launching frequencies of, of vehicles. I I mean, uh, you you could you should ideally be able to char um, charge up under one minute. Um, Okay. The the main issue is I would say when you charge too quickly, the supercapacitors don't charge properly, because um, there is a there is an inherent limitation within the supercapacitors chemistry. If, if you sort of if it is something that uh, uh, I, I mean I didn't mention here, but basically um, the slower you charge it, the better the supercapacitor sort of charges. Um, because there is like a there is an element called the voltage dependence dependent capacitance, but 
in terms of just the system itself and uh, the overall system and the balancing, so far, uh, based on the data I got from the simulations, I didn't find any um, issues. But as I said, okay. uh, these kind of problems really depend on uh, the next phase when you do a physical model. So should be looked yeah, that's something you would investigate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then the, the final question would be before we close the session, uh, what have been the main main challenges when sizing and, and choosing the architecture uh, for for the systems? Which approach did you did you take there? Um, the the main the main point was uh, the cost, I um, and the, obviously the performance. So the, in terms of performance, the main thing I looked at was the how how to minimize ripple, right? How to uh, keep how to produce the best quality of BZ power supply possible, mm -hmm. right? But then at the same time, how to keep the costs as low as possible. And so that balancing act was uh, was the was the main point here, which I which I as I sort of demonstrated with the table I showed you previously with the cost chart. Um, yeah. So overall, I think we ended up with uh, the best possible uh, design as far as I know. <laughs> yeah. Let's <laughs> hope yeah, so, so we see we see this uh, design topology soon in uh, in Alpha Two. This would be this would be. <laughs> Excellent. The, with this said, I think we are also done with the questions. Um, we're also um, good in time. So with this said, um, I would like to, to thank in the name of the organizing organizations, uh, Swiss Loop to Hyperloop and the um, University of Oldenburg, Institute of Hyperloop Technologies, um, once again for organizing this session. We will see each other next week, the 15th of May, with also two very interesting talks. On the one hand side, one from uh, Edward Stubing from ICOM talking about Hyperloop, a technology readiness and risk assessment plan ex exercise. And then uh, another talk from Heiko Duin from the Institute for Production and Logistics of Bremen, who is going to be talking about uh, planning of Hyperloop based cargo tubes routes for sustainable logistics solutions. So we would have a more uh, an approach on, on, on the logistics point of view of, of this new mean of transport. Um, so with this said, um, again, thanks everyone for joining and uh, we hope to see you next week, again, at 6 p.m. in this uh, meeting room. Thank you very much.